Laser klingt immer aufregend. Laser always uh, sounds very exciting. Darüber, wie Laserlicht sinnvoll eingesetzt werden kann, wird uns How are you going to apply it? Ready, we are going to learn in this talk now. Dr. Matthias Koch is a, a biological physicist. And uh, on the side, he also was uh, interested in uh, building gardens. For his PhD, he was applying lots of different technologies for laser spectroscopy. He's also interested in um, compilers, biology. Ist der begeisterte Lindy Hop Tänzer und Ja, so dances Lindy Hop. Begrüßt mit mir sehr herzlich. Eine der interessiertesten Welcome uh, welcome auf der diesjährigen RC3. Bühne frei to this Dr. Matthias Koch. Congress and here the stage is free for Dr. Matthias Koch. Hallo, ich bin Matthias Hello. Koch und möchte heute eine kleine Einführung in die Laserspektroskopie. Hi, Matthias Koch, I would like to first give a quick introduction. I have a PhD in biophysics. I was using this technology uh, for my PhD thesis. While I was studying, I was thinking, what is happening today? And I was thinking, and it would be better if I investigated this myself and here I am with this topic. What happens when we're shining this in? We have a lamp here. And first, we're going to look for, uh, for an overview of what is happening here. Sometimes it happens that the molecule after the excite excitation um, drops back to another band, and so maybe and maybe there's a difference between the absorbed photon and the radiated photon. So maybe if we shine a red blue laser into a, into a solution, we also get a green and red light out. So and so the first excited state. Um, if we sometimes the photon then gets absorbed and there's an interaction between the molecule and the light and this is called the the Raman Stokes radiation and and in sometimes it is lifted to another vibrational state and and it and it goes back without radiation into the low state of the first excited state and then there are many possible state changes for the lower band for the electronic base state and this means that the radiation is rather broadband and because of the uh, first first state that doesn't radiate um, and so the state the frequency of the radiated photon doesn't really depend on the laser that you shine into it. So now we look at the spectrum and the wavelength scale shows the rainbow from violet to red and that's a wavelength of uh, 400 to around 700 nanometers and the um, sensitivity of our eyes at the edges is relatively low and the photon energy is between 1.8 electron volts to 3 electron volts at the violet end. 
So this uh, setup, we have a, a glass and there are algae in it. And so it's a liquid in a liquid and it's a special algae and and it can be used for creating dyes. And in this glass, there's a, a plexi on, a, on a perspex plate and there are lamps in it that are used for calibrating the spectrometer. And below the perspex plate is a, a mixer and the culture to, to mix it um, so that each individual molecule will only come into contact with the laser very briefly, so it doesn't, isn't changed by that. And there's also a fiber bundle and to shine the laser into, into the uh, solution. And there are different other fibers which uh, pick up the light and send it to the spectrometer. And we have a blue laser with 473 nanometers wavelengths and 50 milliwatts. And this laser is a, it's a single mode laser and has a very narrow band of only 12 picometers. And the, we have a spectrometer, which um, also uh, has a CCD camera. And we see the raw from the spectrometer, in this case, without the low pass filter. And this very strong signal is the Rayleigh, dif Rayleigh diffraction of the... And in red, we can also see some artifacts that also are caused by missing the low-pass edge filter. And there's something between 550 and 600 nanometers. It's also an artifact. And the inner surfaces are not perfect in the spectrometer and part of the light is uh, going into other directions. But in a very strong signal, there also can be relatively strong artifacts. So we have this uh, low-pass edge filter and the Rayleigh peak and the little artifact peak are now gone. And the strong signal that we see now between 650 and 750 nanometers is the chlorophyll fluorescence. Chlorophyll fluorescence is from the green in the leaves and uh, absorbs blue and red light and, and also the low red. And here's the same spectrum with a logarithmic intensity scale and the chlorophyll peak is in green and we see in between 550 and 600 nanometers there's a little bump. This is the spectral line of water. And we can see that um, the, the line is much smaller than the chlorophyll fluorescence. And uh, I marked this one little peak, um, and it's a Bremen line of the carotid. And the, this is the place where the filter uh, becomes transmissive. The calibration, for the calibration, we have these little neon lamps and it uh, lights up in orange, but it has also lines in the green-blue range and they can use them for calibration. If uh, there, are many, there are many ways to calibrate the spectrometer, but uh, the little neon lamp is a very simple way to do that. Neon has very, very many lines, so we can so we can use them to calibrate it and here we see that again and now the chlorophyll fluorescence has been cut off so you can see the Raymond lines much better and the strong signal here from the water at 560 nanometers and we can also see the neon lamps so the position of the spectral lines can be compared to the published values. And we see that it doesn't fit completely, but it's quite close. And with a correction of 5.25 nanometers, um, then we have the exact position of the neon, of the neon lines. The small range around 500 nanometers has another 
uh, neon spectral lines and it shows which range the spectrometer can normally record und das ist uh, diese sehr breiten Bereiche entstehen dadurch dass das that the spectrometer can and uh, this is to show um, the total spectrum and to create that it took about half an hour to record this total spectrum and here are the Raman lines and there's a, a shift compared to the excitation and in the Raman spectroscopy we can sometimes use a scale of the so-called relative wave number and it's a very strange unit but it uh, is proportional to the and it is uh, created from the reciprocal reciprocal from the two wavelengths and here we have cut off the Raman line and this is the Raman spectrum of the carot carotenoids and this uh, it, uh, this is created by uh, by matter that is only present in small quantities and there are several algorithms and uh, I have invented one of those and uh, published it in a scientific paper and to remove the baseline when we remove the baseline we are left with the Raman spectrum alone and who ca who wants to know more about this and has to do some uh, detective work with the literature and so the Raman lines above 2000 wave pairs and the lower Raman lines who can read any more in the literature can find these but uh, this is uh, outside the scope of this of this talk to show this I have shown the pure beta carotene so only carrots and excited it with two different wavelengths. In the blue line we have 500 nanometers and then we have the green line to compare this with the, the spectrum line. We see that it's a little bit steeper, it's a little bit higher. So you see that it's a little bit stronger this line. The frequency is dependent so that uh, as it's growing stronger, you see the blue line. The, here we see the carotene and ethanol uh, resonance card, resonance map. This smart, part of the spectrum, it shows as it goes up that the frequency and these things are relative to each other. There's something to watch here. If we have to count relative waves. We have 500 nanometers. It's better carotene, like in the map. Together we have it with the spectrum, resonance and absorption. It's a maximum. It's the first response of and See how it goes up high, then it goes down again. 
So there's a response from the chemicals. The, the status goes high and then back. The proton is responding to the more energy. It's very, very strong here. So this is an excitation wavelengths uh, a different and through the logarithmic scale, scale we can also separate the anti-Stokes lines. The special of the anti-Stokes lines is they, are, they cannot be covered by fluorescence and they, they have a dependency on the absolute temperature because the vibrational states uh, uh, correspond to the Boltzmann distribution and and there you can um, so you can measure the absolute temperature with a laser with a laser beam for after this uh, small overview um, of the effects it's now we are talking about how we can use that at first the selection of the laser we usually have to use a blue or violet laser that's a very simple reason for that it, you know where it is, even if you use the laser laser protection goggles. Um, other lasers may be much more extensive, more expensive, but um, with a red laser you might uh, be tempted to remove your goggles, but you should never do that, so you can see the light. So a blue laser is good, so you can use a piece of paper with a with a sharpie, and then you can uh, hold it into the beam and see where it is and the skin will also fluoresce a little in yellow, and so you can see with your finger where the laser beam is. Uh, for the, Here's a small do-it-yourself for a spectrometer, and um, I, the spectral range is important, and you, if you have the whole visible range, that's good, but uh, if you want to do the Raymond spectroscopy, you need a very high resolution and you need to be able to filter parts of the spectrum. And uh, the sensitivity is a bit like the aperture within photography, and so you have a grid and the camera. And if the slit is very low, then there's only very little light, and there's only very little light on the camera, but so good resolution. And so it depends on how the optics are built. If maybe there are other apertures or small small parts, and you have to um, look what is better, better here. So for Raymond spectroscopy, it's very important to be very precise there, and you have to experiment a bit. Another important part is the dynamic range. A normal camera has maybe 10 to 12 bits dynamic range, whereas the camera which I used to record it um, has 16 bits of dynamic range. And you have to experiment a bit with that as well. And But with a webcam which has only 8 bits uh, per channel isn't very helpful if you uh, don't want to look at the fluorescence but also some uh, some other more interesting things and another part is that um, if you exceed the maximum contrast um, from 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 the camera of the camera then you are looking only at so if you have a very strong a very strong beam then it may be diffracted inside the camera and then you, if you have optical low-pass filters, they are very expensive. But the spectrometer, if you build it yourself, you can disassemble it and and put a little uh, um, a little blind there, and uh, so you can easily find that and block it out if there's uh, and. Um, Maybe you already have something like that in your do-it-yourself box. Um, 
and LEDs can, can be used as sensors, for example, and I have a f measured a few LEDs and what their receptive spectrum is, and I have published it. Uh, the most easily accessible range is, uh, is uh, dependent on the material of the sensor. For example, silicon can use 1,100 to 1,000, and, and you have to improvise maybe if you need another range. Other semiconductor materials have other ranges. Um, silicon carbide goes of 200 to 400, indium gallium arsenide goes from 800 to 1,700, and germanium is from 800 to 1,800 nanometers. And and some uh, some tubes also um, create ultraviolet light, and you have, just have to experiment a bit. Maybe it's also possible to you open up a germanium power transistor and use that as a sensor, but the sensitivity will probably be very low. And for measuring Raman lines, it, that's a really technical challenge, and the. Uh, absorption can be measured relatively easy. So I want to show you some examples how such measures can be broken down, such measurements. The classical measurements uh, where you use a lamp and a monochromator and then you have uh, use a photodiode as a sensor and then it goes through a beam splitter and through a photodiode and then through the through the liquid that you want to measure into a photodiode and then you can find out the specific wavelength and the absorption um, is dependent on the thickness of the material and and an absorption coefficient that is also dependent on several parameters Besides the lamp and the monochromator, um, and uh, there may be variations in the intensity of the lamp, and to compensate for that, um, if we can have something where the very LEDs have a very very stable intensity, and so the intensity can be measured with a photodiode, and the intensi intensity of the LED itself can be measured that way. For example, there's a an, uh, probe both of those can be shined through the finger and a photodiode can, uh, can be measured with a photodiode. And uh, the blood oxy oximeter oximeters uh, work like that and shine through this through the finger and the way that you can measure uh, how much oxygen is in the blood and you can use a spectrometer to look at the light of the sun and with several LEDs with different wavelengths you can also experiment with those a good um, example is the infrared hygrometer. It uses the sun as the light source and shines them through through the sample and uh, use LEDs um, as the sensor for 880 or 940 nanometers. And uh, water vapor has an absorption line near 900 nanometers, so you can figure out the a water vapor concentration in the air and can build a hygrometer that way. And here's another example if you want to examine chlorophyll fluorescence. If you look at the leaf with a shine on it with a blue or green lamp and with a blue uh, LED, you can shine at, at the plant and use a dark red filter but it's not easy to record that on video, but um, you'll see, you can still see it in this photo. And you have perhaps seen the spectacular infrared photography photos. 
and you can use a dark red filter for that and you can see that the sky becomes blue because the blue is absorbed by the filter and the leaves become very bright and on this photo uh, you can see on the right it is very bright and the tree on the left side is uh, much less bright and that is um, because the chlorophyll fluorescence um, is a reaction to get rid of uh, superfluous additional light and so that the leaves don't get um, overloaded with light. Um, you can also take photos like this from satellites or airplanes and can figure out where it is dry or if there's a danger of a forest fire. Um, if you measure the chlorophyll fluorescence, you need uh, three LEDs, a blue one for uh, excite the fluorescence and uh, two, two red ones for uh, detecting the fluorescence. And the emission spectrum of this LED is at 700 nanometers and you can see that they overlap and the reason is that we have a, a semiconductor with a band gap between and so red and yellow LEDs have a similar band gaps and so they can see their own light and the green blue or ultraviolet LEDs uh, have an indirect band gap semiconductors and emission and sensitivity are separate so they cannot see their own light but only uh, different uh, bandwidths and the sensitivity is either it starts at the emission spectrum or is and, and here is a bright red, light red LED. And you, if you look at the sensitivity of the two LEDs together with the chlorophyll fluorescence, you can see that the light red LED cannot see the chlorophyll fluorescence, whereas the dark red LED um, can see the chlorophyll fluorescence. And so we have everything that we need and we can uh, excite it with a blue LED, use the light red LED as a reference and use the dark red LED uh, for measuring the data. And you can see uh, the result of the uh, chlorophyll fluorescence uh, from a leaf which I have created with these three LEDs. And for the blue, for this measurement, the blue LED will flash. And then uh, I use the two red LEDs with an uh, operational amplifier and you can see the red curve is the uh, measurement and the blue curve is the reference. And you flash the, the blue light into the leaf and sometimes the LED will light between the measurements and, and may, they fluoresce uh, very strongly for a short period of time and so continue time getting. So this curve is known as the Kautsky effect. At the end, um, I give you some literature tips for people who are still curious and uh, some areas that can be very interesting. For example, uh, lighting the light uh, emission of the sea. And you can uh, use uh, microscopy, for example. And uh, so, and uh, the main component analysis can be done and maybe you can use hyperspectral cameras which can record a very large spectrum and th they use a dye and uh, two uh, very shortly um, very short excitations so and uh, see you again in the q and a wow was für eine komplexe materia so what a complex matter. My head is really rotating. I learned a lot. Thank you very, very much for this huge impact. Um, I, I feel like I'm fried by a laser and, and saturated with information. Thanks. Thanks a lot. One of the first questions was, if the laser light with which you 
detektierst nicht einfach Due to touch with the laser, the um, probe. Bitte um einen kleinen Moment Geduld. Uh, one moment. Der Laser hat nur 50 The laser only has 50 milliwatts for the probe. Und die Probe ist gerührt. Jede Alge kommt nur kurz. Uh, there's only um, a part, it, it, it only is um, together for a curt moment, a fast man moment. Das heißt, du kitzelst die Probe mit 50 milliwatt, ja nur eher. Klare Antwort, ja. That is a clear answer, yes. Du hast es ja nicht nur mit leb leblosen Proben zu tun, sondern mit lebendigen Organismen. Setzt du diese Proben nicht unter Stress? Uh, is it not stress for the measurement? Um, does it influence it? Matthias has replied that, yeah, there may be surprises, uh, for example, there may be foaming or uh, boiling over.